Hey, God's good. Um, for those of you who are back for the first time in a while, um, you know, welcome, welcome back. Uh, there's, you're going to hear some just music and things going on just for a few minutes here. We actually have different venues that are going on right now. So uh, you're in here. We have another venue over there that's full of kids. We had our first kids service today for the first time in seven months. Seriously, it was so good. I walked down there. I got a, I got a picture and there's a bunch of kids that are that are worshiping Jesus and playing Simon Says. Come on, that's what it's all about right there. And then downstairs, we have our youth ministry and they'll be wrapping up worship here. So if you hear them, but we're trying to spread out so that we can get more people in the room and it's, uh, it's a good season. So we have been in a season where uh, we haven't been able to open up as much as we want. That season now is over. We just have to be strategic. We spent the first few months kind of on one of these, you know, the whole world was kind of going this way and then we sort of hit the bottom and now we're starting to nose up. I think it's a time for us, you know, when, you're, when, you're, when things are going down, you look down, but when things start to nose up, what do you do? You look up. It's time for us to look up. It's time for us to have an up vision, to have an up heart, to have an up spirit and uh, let's go forward. How many of you know, I've said it every week, but you can't quarantine Jesus and you can't quarantine what Jesus is doing Come on, in the lives of people and in the city, you just can't do it. You can't quarantine this vision. It just means that there's another way to get it done. And uh, we're going to pray. We're going to jump in this morning, but it's good to see you. Okay, so Father, I thank you for today. I thank you, Lord. I pray for our city, first of all. I pray you bless our city. I pray that you bless all of our city officials and all of our first responders. I pray from the Capitol building right down through all, everything down, down even to the, into the schools with the teachers. And there's so much to pray about. I pray for our city and our state today. I pray, Lord, that you would bless it. I pray that there would be peace. I pray for the peace of God that surpasses our context and our understanding. Bless our city today. Bless every church in the Denver metro area. Father, those that are meeting, those that are not meeting, I pray, Father, that you would uh, stir their hearts. Lord, that you would refresh the fire in them, that you would stir something in them fresh and new for this season. I pray, Lord, for the faith the faith of the body of Christ to begin to, to raise, to, be, to rise up right now and to have faith for things. I pray, Jesus, that you would refresh us, that you would uh, anoint us. I pray, God, that you would call us, that there would be a fresh call out to the, to the people, to the church, to the houses. I, I pray there would be a call of God on us right now and that we would heed the call, that we would go after the things of God. I know sometimes it's, it's difficult now, but we can still go after it. We can go after it even if it doesn't look like it used to look like. Jesus, bless the churches. Bless every pastor, every leader. Father, those that are going through stuff right now, we know that bless the finances, bless um, everything that you're doing in the body of Christ. Father, in our city, we're just grateful today. We're grateful for all that you have done in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Now, just for fun, clap one more time because God's so good. Good to see you. I haven't seen some of you in a while. I know you're waiting for kids, for kids to Kids Church to, to come back. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't blame you if <clears throat> I wouldn't blame you if you went out and got breakfast during church. Don't do that. I'm just saying, free babysitting. We don't look at it that way, but let's let's be honest. Uh, we've all been tempted. Uh, good to have you back today, and and we know that as the weeks go by, the church will continue to fill back up again. And one exciting thing is that we have uh, in the last few weeks just continued to have visitors. And so if you're here for the first time. We love you already, and we're glad you're here, and we would love to have lunch with you. I know they said it, but we are having lunch next week after this service. Uh, we'll have a, it'll be social distance and all that, but we'll have a good time. That's a time for you to get to know us and us to get to know you, get to meet some of the pastors, and we are back on, I believe we're back on track. I believe we're back in it. Come on, we're back in the game. It, it's, it's on. Like, we're, we're praying, and we're believing God, and there's some cool things happening. So, and ladies, <clears throat> ladies, for the women's event, please all of you participate in the women's event. Everybody register, everybody get the magazine and get all the testimonies. Please do that. As a matter of fact, the question shouldn't be, am I gonna do it? Am I gonna participate? The question should be, who can I bring with me? Who can I call? Who, even if I have to stay in my house with them, I'll go to the house, we'll have a little house party like some people are doing, but who can you get involved? We really believe that this is a big year. God's got a word for the, the women of the church. 
I also believe that there's a, there is a prophetic anointing on what God is doing there. And uh, uh, there's not a man in this room that isn't thankful for the women in this room because we need you to pray for us. We need our own revival. But there's something on the women. I'm telling you, God's moving. All right, ladies, who are you going to invite? Okay? I want you to take your Bibles out, whether that's a Bible, a phone, an iPad, or whether some of you I know have the whole thing memorized from front to back. Just go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, and we're going to talk just for a minute. What I'm going to do is, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm going to read a few verses and exhort. There, there's a really cool story in Acts chapter 17. Now, I've touched on some of this, but I'll, I'll, just keep, I'll just keep touching on it and shaping it as we go. The local church, the thing that you're sitting in right now, was birthed in the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, the book of Acts in the Bible is the history of the local church. The Gospels are the history of the Savior, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The, the um, outline, sort of this is how it happened with Christ. But when you get into uh, the book of Acts, you actually have the history of the local church. And the local church in, in those days was, it was, a, it was a small group in homes. That's why we're doing devote groups, which by the way, there are over 600 people in devote groups right now, which is amazing. And people still trying to sign up. Please don't because... <laughs> because it, there's only two left and you'd miss half the thing, but we're going to do it again. So we're going to do a couple of these, all right? So, but, but it started there, then it went into the synagogues. And what happened in Acts is the church was birthed and it went around the world very quickly. Uh, within 56 years, the local church had spread to the entire known world. And there was a couple reasons, right? There was a whole bunch of people there at Pentecost and the big, you know, the big gathering that happened in Jerusalem, if you know the story, and God just moved miraculously and all those people, they were there for a census and or they, they were there for a festival, two festivals actually. And after the festival was over, they all went back to their nations and their cities and they started churches. And so another thing that happened is that um, there was an apostle, there was a guy named Stephen. He was actually a, the first deacon, if you know that, just means servant. Stephen was martyred, and when Stephen was killed, all the people who were there, they got afraid for their own lives because the church was exploding. And so they, they ran for their lives and went back to their own cities, but they started churches. And it's incredible to see how fast that the church actually grew in the book of Acts. It's, it's, a, it's a miraculous multiplication thing. And there was just one man, there was one man who got saved, and his name was Paul. Now, for most of you, you would know who Paul is, but some of you may not. Paul was a young boy, he's a young Hebrew boy. He was a brilliant young man. He was a genius. Actually, when he grew up, he became a doctor, got his doctorate. He had the doctorate in the law. He was one of the great teachers uh, of the law. And he actually was there when Stephen died. He actually, when, they, when, the, when people killed and martyred Stephen, he was about, he was just maybe 12 years old and all the people came over and they threw their coats on, his name was Saul at that time. They threw his coats on and said, hold our coats while we kill this guy. And so that was the same young man. And when he grew up, he never forgot that. And it, it spoke to him. It touched his heart. He couldn't get rid of it. And then in the middle of the book of Acts, this young man gets saved. This young man who was a genius, who was brilliant in the law, he got saved. And he became a Christian. And he became one of the greatest apostles that ever walked the face of the earth. And he actually wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. So this is the guy I'm, I'm talking about today. And after a while... Uh, they just wanted to kill him. People just wanted to kill him because everywhere he went, things just started to happen. You know, we, we, we call this, you know, we use the word persecution lately, but can I tell you the persecution that we're experiencing, which in a, in a sense is, is real, but can I tell you it was nothing. It was nothing like with these guys. It cost them their lives. They were all martyred. They were all killed. Peter was hung upside down on a cross and martyred. And they were, they were beheaded and tortured. And, and Paul just ran for his life. But what's really cool is this. In the middle of all of this, he started to do this, these things called missionary trips. So when you hear the word missionary, I'm a missionary. My family missionaries to Africa. Those, that missionary thing came, came from here. It was Paul. And he started, he got saved and he had, was in a city and he started doing these missionary trips and he would go out to places in the world and he would preach the gospel and then he would help not only start churches, but he would actually train the church leaders that were there. And in Acts 17, there's a little portion of scripture here about one of those trips. Now, on one trip, on one missionary trip, the disciples, people were hiding him, people were trying to get him and he ended up in Greece and I just had a picture in my heart of a beach in Greece. 
I probably should come back and be spiritual for a minute, but maybe someday, someday, that he ended up in Athens. And when he was in Athens, something very, something really incredible happened. Now, I'm going to read it to you. Now, in the back, I don't think I gave you all these verses, but I'm actually going to start in verse 22 of chapter 17, and I'm going to read this to you. Talk for a few minutes, and then we're going we're gonna to move on. But here, starting in verse 22, it says, it says, Paul then stood up in a meeting at the Areopagus, and he said, People of Athens, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Now, when you think of the Greeks, I mean, the Greeks were religious. They had gods for everything. They had idols for everything. I mean, everything. There were thousands of them everywhere. He's, and he says, I, I see you're very religious. Verse 23, for as I walked around, I looked carefully at your objects of worship. I even found an altar. Now, if you have your Bible, I want you to mark this, okay? Mark this one right here. I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. And so you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. In other words, so here he is. He's coming into town, and the road into town was riddled with, with altars and things that you could worship. And all of these altars had names. They're all these different gods. They, they had gods for everything. And as Paul was coming into town, you can imagine he's filled with Christ. He's filled with Jesus, and he's trying to change the world. He goes by an altar off in a field, and the altar said, to the unknown God. They had, they had gods that they worshiped for everything. They even had an altar for one they didn't even know his name. And Paul says, I'm going to tell you his name. This is the context. Now that altar came from, from somewhere. And what happened was is that at an earlier time in their history, they had a horrible plague. And the plague was wiping people out. And they prayed to all of their gods. None of their gods could stop the plague. No one could heal anybody. Everybody was dying. And so in desperation, there was a, a philosopher, a poet, actually. He had an idea. He, he felt that he had a, a spiritual moment. He said, here's what we're supposed to do. What we're going to do is we're going to go out in this field next to Mars Hill. We're going to take a bunch of sheep. And we're going to let the sheep go. And, and the sheep are going to run through the field, and they're hungry. By the way, they, they actually were starving the sheep on purpose. This, is act, this actually is a, is a historical record. They, they starved the sheep, so when they let the sheep go, they would be hungry, and they would be looking for food. And then he said, if any of the sheep stop and lay down, that'd be weird because they're so hungry. We're going to put the food out there. If any of them stop and lay down, it's a sign from God we are to put an altar there to the unknown God and were to pray to that altar and they did it. They let the sheep go, the sheep stopped, the, uh, it laid down and they built an altar to the unknown God and they prayed that healing would come and guess what happened? Everybody got healed and the plague was gone. And now Paul is walking through and he goes, he goes, I even saw this altar that said to the unknown God, you have built altars with your hands for centuries, you're, you're trying so hard, and the one story that you have where something worked out, you don't even know his name. Paul says, I'm going to tell you his name. Greek, Greek mythology, Greek religion, this was a place of works. It was a place where you built things with your hands, and you, you made idols, and you built temples, and everything is if we can build another temple. If we, but the one thing, the one temple, the one thing they worshipped that actually did something, they put it in a field, and they, they couldn't even get the name of the God, but they knew he was out there somewhere. Now watch what happens. He says, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Verse 24. And then he, then he begins, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And then he just, he just throws, he just, he just throws down. He just goes and does not live in your temples built by your human hands. And he's not served by human hands either as if he needed anything from you, but rather he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Verse 26, and from one man being Adam, he made all the nations 
that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times. God marked out all of our appointed times. Do you, you have to understand, we're, we were actually meant to be here right now. We're the generation that was supposed to be here in 2020. We were called and created before you were ever here to be here during this time because God knew in his being that we had a purpose to be here. We are the ones that are called to deal with what we're dealing with. It's our, it's our calling. It's not just our mission, it's our calling because we were here by the hand of God. And it says that he, uh, he also gave them the boundaries of their lands, verse 27. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach for him and find him, though he is not far from all of us. Now think about it. We're in the middle of this season that we're in. God put you and I here so that we would seek him so that we could fulfill the purpose for us being here in the first place. Sometimes it takes a little pressure to try to reach out and get something done and, and believe, but we're here right now, and this is incredible. I love this. God did this so that we would seek him, for in him we live and we move and we have our being. So he's telling these, these people in Greek at the Areopolis, he's saying, there's a God of heaven and earth who actually put you here right now. And the only real miracle that you ever saw because of that altar right there that says you don't know his name, he knows your name. And you were put here at this time and in this place for a reason and for a purpose. And in everything that is happening in the world, it is in him that you live and you move and you have your being. And then, he, and then he ends it with this. This is incredible. As some of your, of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Now what is interesting is the poet that wrote the words that he's quoting was the same person who actually is the one who told them to let the sheep go and build the altar. He quoted those words. And so here we are in the middle of where we're at. Okay, so check this out. The God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in, in temples built by human hands. One of the most important lessons that we need to remember in this season right now is that, that God does not live in anything that we build. He resides in what he built. God does not need us to build a temple for him. God doesn't need us to build something, to make something. We have this thing inside of us as humans where we just think that we're all that. And you know what? We're going to build it. It's going to be amazing. Isn't it going to be amazing? God's going to be so impressed. God's going to be so blown away by what we build him. He's going to come, come and he's going to want to live in that building. That's what some of the, the cults in the world do. They build these giant temples. And they say that God lives in the temple. And if you want to know God, you got to go into our temple. But that's not Bible because in, in the Gospel of John, on, it says that you, in Matthew it says that you, in Luke, it says that you're the temple. There's no temple. I don't have to walk. I don't have to. I, there's, no, there's no God in residing in a, in a brick and mortar building any more than he is where you're at right now at your house, on your deck, eating an omelet. Oh man, I'm hungry. Drinking that coffee, listening to me preach, or if you're sitting at a coffee shop. No, 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 no. You don't go to God. God goes with you. That's why he needs you. You're the hands and the feet of Jesus and everywhere you go, you take him with you. The temple is you. God does not reside in temples that are built by human hands. No. And there's nothing that we can do to impress God. I, one of my favorite stories uh, from the Gospel of Matthew is, is, where, um, is where Peter goes up and you know, uh, three of the disciples are on top of a mountain and Jesus is with them. And Moses and Elijah show up. So they're up there, they're praying, they're having this moment, right? And here's Peter, and he's hanging out. And uh, James and John, and, and they're, just, they're just like, they're having a moment. And then all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah show up. I mean, let's just be super, really honest. That would be cool. That would be cool. It probably looked like, I don't know if you guys even knew this, but about, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, there was this move in churches to do hologram church. I don't know if any of you saw it, but I actually saw it. It was pretty awesome. They had these hologram cameras, these like 
three, four D, whatever they are. Remember, we were, we were watching them. And like, you have multiple campuses. So instead of watching the pastor on the screen, they hit a button and he just appears. Just like, it's like, and he just walks around on the platform. And um, it was pretty incredible. We saw a couple of them and we're like, wow, that's, that's incredible. I don't know what it was like, but all of a sudden, here's Moses and Elijah. And Peter, Peter literally, this is what he says. He goes like this. He goes, he goes, wow. He looks at Jesus, he looks at Moses and Elijah, and he goes, he says, Jesus, you are going to be so glad that I'm here right now. Can, can you imagine a man, Peter, who had all kinds of issues, right, all kinds of attitudes, and he just says, you know, Lord, you are, you're, you're so lucky that you have me. Here's what I'm going to do. And, and right about then, Moses and Elijah start to have a little side conversation. Moses says to Elijah, now this isn't in the Bible. It's just in my Bible. Moses says to Elijah, just pray, Elijah. Elijah's like, why? Because Peter's about to open his mouth. <laughs> Elijah's like, has he not learned his lesson yet? And he's like, nope. He's just getting a little awkward. Can you feel it? He's like, yeah, I can feel it. How's your resurrected holy body? It's cool. I, I love coming back. It's been a while. This is, this is sick. Um, okay, pray for Peter. And Jesus is just standing there waiting. Peter goes, I got you. I got you. I got you, God. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to build you an altar. I'm going to build an altar for Moses. I'm going to build an altar for Elijah. I got all three of you covered. And while he does it, Scripture says, that lights came down onto the spot and God spoke from heaven and said, Peter, this is my son, the Messiah. Shut up and listen. Now, it doesn't say shut up. But it kind of does. When you read it, it's just exclamation points. The Greek is like all big and everything. It's like, Peter, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased in. It, the Bible says, listen to him. In other words, we're in the middle of all this. There are times where we need to just kind of settle and listen and not try to show Jesus what we can do. Because I'm done with that. I ain't got nothing left. Everything I tried didn't work. Right? But here's, what, here's Peter's problem. This is why God intervened. Because he said, I'm going to make each of you an altar. I'm going to build one for you, Jesus. One for you, Moses. Woo, one for Elijah. Woo, I'm going to buy all of you an altar. And by doing that, he brought God down to the level of man. And he elevated man to the level of God. Because Moses and Elijah, Elijah, they were men. They weren't gods. You don't build them an altar and you don't worship them. There's only one God. There's only one Jesus. And that's why God was up in heaven looking down. Elijah was like, oh, get ready. Here it comes. I can hear the big man now. He stood up on the throne. You hear that? Heaven is creaking. He just stood up. Peter, this is my son. Will you just listen to him? And what we do is we tend in the middle of, of, of crisis we like to go, oh, I got this. I'm going to build something with my hands that God is going to reside in. God cannot reside in anything that we build. He lives in who he created. And it's a different walk. It's a different journey. It's a different life. It's just not how it works. He goes on to say, he's not built, he's not living in anything built by human hands. And he's also not served by human hands as if he needed anything. I, I've just been in a season, and I know you are all, are, are all too. I, I read a verse on Friday night to the leaders from Second Chronicles. Um, I can't remember the address right now, but it basically said, find your position, be still, and let God do his thing. What is our position? See, we, we also can't, like, there's nothing that we can do. Is anybody here, are any of you just doers? Do, is there anybody here, you just have to be doing something? Does anybody here have the gift of hospitality? Ha, raise your hands. Who just loves to be hospitable? 
Well, I, I mean, I kind of do, but I also have the gift of receiving your hospitality. <laughs> That's a whole different spiritual gift. I could find it in the scriptures somewhere. Some, but some people just like, they can't stop. You can't slow down. You can't not do something. I got to do this. I got to do that. And you got the whole Mary and Martha thing and one's worshiping and one's trying to do the dishes and make the food and oh, Martha, Martha, will you just relax for a minute? And, but there's something inside of us. We think that we can, that we can serve it. See, the, in, in, in the Greeks, they, they, would, they would sacrifice to all of the altars, all of them. And when one didn't work, they would sacrifice to another and they were constantly just sacrificing and doing things with their hands to try to find some kind of fulfillment and make it all work. And he's like, look, you can't, I don't need anything from you. Now God needs us ultimately for the gospel's sake. And I understand that. But you know, God can do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. And you're not the key to his plan. Like, like you have a part in the plan, you're a key to your own part of the plan, but make no mistake, if we put our hand in the face of God and we don't submit our lives and we walk away, God will find somebody else to do what he had called you to do, and then when you see them do it, the book of Hebrews says, like Esau, you're going to watch them do it, and you're going to begin to weep and cry, and you're going to want it back with tears, but you don't have a right heart. You're going to find jealousy, and things are going to come up inside of you. No. God does not need us to do anything. He calls us to do things, to participate and to partner and to love him and know what it's like to sacrifice for people. If you want to know what Jesus is like and how to understand Jesus, you really want to know Jesus, put your life on the line for people. Love people to the point to where it hurts and you bleed. And you, and you don't know what to do. You just cry for people and love people. That's what Jesus did. But there's nothing that we can do to make something look better or feel better. We can't serve our way out of it. Uh, we mess things up. Any, have you ever tried to fix something and you messed it up worse? That's me whenever I try to fix something at the house. Plumbing, refrigerators, anything with a motor. That's why I, I used to try to be a man's man. You know, you know my man card, my, my man card says, lattes in the Nordstrom's rack. I, I go to Donna, I'd be like, Donna, I got this. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? <laughs> Thanks. Anyway, so I'd be like, yeah, baby, baby, I got this. And I would go fix something and then she would start to pray. <laughs> because inevitably, whatever was broken would be more broken when I was finished. <laughs> And then actually, she's actually, she's actually better at some, some things than I am. If you don't know this about my wife and I, we have this incredible, this is, this is a marriage, we have an arrangement, okay? <laughs> there are things that I love, I love to do. I'm going to tell you, I love to, I love to grocery shop. Like, I live for it, don't I? Yep. I, I mean, King Supers is my destiny. <laughs> I got it down, if y'all need some King Supers. I love to shop. I love to cook. I even sew. I've made my own clothes. I have. I've made my own. I made a Hawaiian shirt one time. It was the coolest thing ever, and I just forgot. I put the buttons on the wrong side, and I realized I'd made a blouse. That was a big mistake. <laughs> but I love it. Donna loves. She loves to mow the lawn. And I'm like, you brought the woman into my life, Lord. <laughs> that I have been dreaming of my whole life. She loves to clean the garage. She, she, she's got tools. Like, and, and it's kind of funny, but I would try to do things and I, I'd break them. Has anybody here ever tried to fix something and it was worse when it was, that's me. That's, that's us in our lives. I was down at the preschool in the daycare and uh, there are these three little kids and I was looking through the window, I was watching them. And they just had lunch, and there was food everywhere. These little, I don't, I don't know what ages they were, because I'm but it's about this big, whatever age that is. One, two, three. Um, about that bit, about that age. And they were, they had just had lunch, and they were, the teacher had, had kind of dressed them up and for cleaning, you know, it was really cute. They had big, giant, huge, like rubber gloves on, you know. And um, 
and these wipes that they were pulling out of this little carton thing. And so they had gloves and wipes and, and there was food everywhere. And I was watching them and they were literally trying to clean and they were on their hands and knees and they're, they're pushing the food around. And I'm telling you, they were so happy. They're pushing food around. They had food in their hair and food on their arms and their clothes. And they were just scrubbing and moving the food around. And then they would switch spots and they would move the other kids' food around. And then they would stand up and then they would see more food and they would move it around. There was food everywhere. It, it was worse after they cleaned than it was before they, you know, started, but they were happy. That's us. You know, God's up in heaven. He's like, just Moses and Elijah, just, just, just let them do it because they're happy. They're happy because because they have realized something perhaps that we're not perfect and, and we mess things up. Aren't you glad the Bible says that while we were still sinners, while we were still a hot mess, while in the middle of all of our stuff in Romans chapter eight, it said that God loved us before we, we made any of our mistakes and he loves us through all of our mistakes. And even in the middle of our messes, we're making worse messes than when we started, God still loves us. He's just smiling up in heaven and he just wants, wants us to know that we're his children. See? But there's nothing we can do to serve. We're like those little kids. If I can just, I'll clean, I'll clean this mess up, Jesus. I'll clean. The, everything's a mess. Family's a mess. I got it. Church is a mess. I got it. Everything's a mess. I got this, Jesus. And Jesus is going, man, they are messing this up so bad. The Holy Spirit's like, are you going to step in here? You know what? Because God has this. God's got it. We've got to keep pressing. We've got to keep pursuing. We've got to keep believing. But God doesn't need us to show him how to fix anything. He just doesn't. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything from us, but rather he gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Aren't you glad that in the middle of all of us trying to do our thing and trying to build things for him and trying to, to fix things for him, that when we wear ourselves out in the middle of it, God just breathes new life into us all the time? Isn't that amazing? That's the picture. The picture is us working really hard and not getting anywhere and having this revelation of God, you know, and then he just keeps breathing life into us. He doesn't leave us or forsake us. Verse 26, from one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history. I think that's incredible. I think, you know, the world today, I mean, honestly, the world today is smaller than it has ever been. This is the first time in my lifetime, I, I think this might be the first time in human history, where all of us around the globe from one side of the planet to the other side of the planet, every nation of every tongue, every color of skin, every language, and every island, every continent, we all face the same challenge at the same time right now. And the Bible says that he marked out our times in history. And when I read that, when I read that, I think, okay, and I think we need to believe this. Like, you need to believe this about your own life. If that's true, that means, God, you, you chose for me, my wife, my family. Or you chose for us to be here in this moment, in this city, in this building, at this time in history. Like, I could have been born in some other really cool times. You ever, you ever thought about that as well? Like, when would you have wanted to be born? Like, in some really cool season to see something. But instead, I was born... Uh, I was born and I'm living now. So if I'm, if I'm here now and this is God's plan, then every one of us, need to, we need to shift our mentality right now. We need to say, no, I'm, I'm so sorry I had to live through 2020. And you got to go, I was called to 2020. I was called to this. I'm not running from it. Where am I going to go? What, I, I can't change anything. I, the world's out of control. But I was, I, I, I was called to this moment. 
I was called to this moment. I was called to my family in this moment. I was called to my friends in this moment. I was called to my city in this moment. I was called to be teaching kids down there in the other room in this moment in all of their little taped out little little six by six little boxes that every kid has to be in down the hall. I was called to put these boxes here so that those little kids could come in here on this Sunday and hear the gospel of Jesus and talk about Jesus. I was called to that. Yeah, called to that. The young, the youth are downstairs. They're having a youth service. Yeah, we were called to 2020. You were called to 2020. You were called to your friends. You were called to your coworkers. You were called to your family. You were called to your church. You were called in this city to be here in 2020. God called us to this year. Let's not run from it. Let's embrace it. And let's remember we can't fix it. We can't change it but what we can do is we can recognize the one who's living in it and God wants to move he wants to shift he wants to change he wants to transform but the key the key is what it says at the end here it says this it says that I put them there I did this God said that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him. But then it also says, find him. So we're not just gonna reach for him, we're not just gonna seek him. Come on church, we gotta believe we're gonna find him. We're going to experience him, we're gonna see him. We're gonna see his goodness, we're gonna see his faithfulness, we're gonna see him love us, he's gonna bring provision, he's gonna get your friends all transformed and, 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 and those, those marriages that are hurting, he's gonna show up in your marriages. We're not just gonna seek him, we're not just gonna search for him, but we're gonna find him. And it's cool, there's some words here in the Greek, it literally means, it re- literally means to wrestle, to reach and to wrestle, to come to your end. The Greek here says it's literally like you're reaching so far that you feel like you're going to fall over when you find him. And some of you just, I know, you just feel like you've been reaching so hard. God doesn't want you to feel alone or left out. He, He wants you to seek for him. We're in the middle of this pandemic in this world that we're in right now because God wants us to find that, that bottom, that, that lower level, like this is the end of ourselves, and now let's go after him. Let's seek him, and let's have revival. Let's believe that the Holy Spirit can move at levels and in depths that he never has before because of where we've been. It doesn't say just seek him. It says you will find him. We want people to find him. And that's why we're here. You know, there's only a couple of things. There's only a couple of things that God cannot do. I'll end with this. You see, th- this is an incredible passage of scripture because there's a couple of things that God can't do. God can do all of this. He can fix it. He can build it. He doesn't need our plans. Doesn't need there's a couple things though he can't do. Do you ever thought about that? Or is there anything that God can't do? There is. There are two things that God cannot do. One is he can't worship. He can't worship. He can worship himself, you know. Praise me, you know. He can't worship. And the other thing he can't do is when we're reaching as far as we can reach and the Lord is wanting us to open up our hearts, he can't open your heart for you. See, only we can worship and only we can open our hearts. That's on us, that's not on him, that's on us. He's he's letting us know that he's here, that he's with us. And he's saying, reach for me because you found me, I'm here. Open your heart and worship. I just had this, I'll end with this. I had this crazy picture this morning of of the, of honestly, it it was like, you know, Bronco Stadium, it was a big stadium and it was filled with talented people. And they were all trying to, to impress Jesus. Jesus was at one end and everybody's showing off their talents and LeBron James was there, and, you know, Peyton Manning's there and Steve Jobs was there. And all the smartest, most gifted, talented people in the world, just one after the other. They're just trying to, just trying to show, I, I got this, let me show you what I can do. And then the thought came to me, no matter what they do, no matter how gifted they are on this earth, God can, God's better. 
God can throw the football farther, trust me. From here to Mars, it's like a bullet. God can sing better. God can, he's smarter. And then in the middle of the crowd, I, this is literally what the picture was this morning when I was praying in my office. I had a picture of all these people in the stadium trying to impress God and he was at one end of the stadium. And then there was this man who stood up and his, his garments were just, his garments were just, just ripped and dirty and torn. And he had nothing. He was nobody, he had no talent, he had no money, he had nothing. And he walked out in the middle of the field and he stood in the middle of all these talented people and he lifted his hands and he began to sing. Great is your faithfulness to, to me. And he just began to sing and God heard it and God just kind of stopped. And he's, he, who is that? Who, who, who said that? Who said that? So you just sing it, sing it for me, just sing it. Okay, they, they, he stands up and he's like, who, who's saying that? They're like, don't worry about him. He's nobody. How did he get in? Security. Get him out of here. And he just kind of fought his way through the crowd. And he's singing again. Come on, sing it. Great is your faithfulness to Keep singing. Great is your faithfulness And then Jesus just stands up. Went into the keep singing. Stands up and he just looks at the man. Great is your faithfulness from, to me. from the rising sun to the setting sun, I will praise your name. Oh. Great is your faithfulness. And then Jesus just stands up went into the stadium and he just says everybody get out of the way and he just because that my friends is the one thing that Jesus cannot do open our hearts and worship him will you stand to your feet come on let's just worship Jesus for a minute lead us man come on and pray. 